from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and here's what's ahead. K-State's Dan O'Brien will size up the market response to the USDA's Grain Production and Stocks reports released yesterday. He'll also talk about the new adjustments in the grain stocks numbers out of China. Now those factor into our price outlooks, especially for corn. The NK State's Dallas Peterson will look at the advantages of applying a herbicide treatment this month on fields to be planted to corn or grain sorghum next spring to get the jump on winter annual weed problems. He'll cover the product options that perform the best for this purpose. And further ahead on Kansas Agricultural Weather, K State's Mary Knapp will be along with us. All this and more coming your way next on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Thanks for joining us for another Agriculture Today. The grain markets since yesterday morning have been taking cues from the USDA's crop production and grain stocks reports, which were posted late morning yesterday. We'll look into what those numbers said with Dan O'Brien joining us from his office in Colby, Northwest Kansas, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. So, Dan, the reports did not follow totally to form. There were a few unexpected numbers that popped out. What stood out to you most of all? Well, the corn production number uh, was lower, uh, which at, at this time, who would have argued or thought we could have, that we wouldn't have seen a higher number? turns out the USDA, after projecting about 14.7, 14.8 billion bushels of uh, U.S. corn to be harvested this year, in the October report came in and projected just over 14.6 uh, yields, 178.9 bushels per acre projected for the U.S. Uh, down from, uh, well, about 181 in the October report. Uh, ending stocks for U.S. corn instead of 1.81 billion bushels down to uh, 1.736 ending stocks to use on the, on the corn side at 11.5%, again down from just about 12% in the October report and 15.5, 14.5 the previous two years. So really some positive uh, numbers in terms of uh, corn supply demand. Uh, really, the only damage on the corn side on, on the projected for usage would be a little bit lower exports, still 2.45. That's down 25 million uh, from the most recent projection. There really weren't other major major problems that were showing up. Feed usage was down about 50 million, but still 5.5 billion bushels. So. Overall, in the supply-demand balance sheet for corn, you have something that's, that's looking more positive. If you're getting down towards 1.7, uh, 1.75 billion bushels, then if, if you have better use moving on through the winter months, you could get below 1.7 to 1.6, uh, start approaching 1.5, and if you get down into those areas, then you, I think, add more worry to the U.S. corn market in terms of the crop getting planted, having good production in 2019, and to get a little bit better corn prospects. Out of all that, the USDA did raise the, the forecast for this 1819 mark in the year by a dime up to 360, so a little bit of acknowledgement that things had, had tightened up a little bit. And so really for corn, uh, a little bit of positive news. Mm-hmm. You add in on that that we had a pretty good export week for corn for the week ending uh, November the 1st, and... So there's some positives, and generally, you look at I got at the corn uh, December futures number. We had been down at about 343, 342 uh, in mid September, and now through a, a combination of factors, we closed yesterday at about 373 and a half. So 30 some cents is to the positive side is sure better than 30 some cents to the lower side. Right. <laughs> so that's a, a positive thing. Soybeans hardly the same positive vibes there. Hardly the same positive vibes. Projection of 4.6 billion bushels. Again, that was also down some. Uh, 
uh, mainly on the, in reaction to the USDA lowering the projected yields by about a bushel per acre. And, and again, the combines are still wanting to be rolling in parts of the country. As uh, In Kansas, we're down about 19, 20% of where we normally are on, on soybean harvest. Still most of it done, but that last part uh, now affected by, by weather conditions in various parts of the state. And, and those same issues elsewhere. So that's, that's an issue, weighing on late harvest and on quality. Uh, so 4.6 billion bushels. A production projected for this year, uh, that would be down from uh, uh, about 90 million bushels from what the projection was in, in October. The uh, ending stocks number was raised for beans, and basically that, that came about because of a lowering of exports uh, from about 2.06 billion bushels down to 1.9. So 100, 160 million bushel reduction on the part of the USDA in terms of their uh, uh, their export expectations for this current marketing year, and again, and that's following from all of the issues happening in the international grain markets as the U.S. and China and other countries work through these trade disputes that the U.S. and Chinese are having. Mm-hmm. So I guess you saw the official first reaction of the USDA in terms of their projected numbers, what type of impact they anticipate that the U.S., China trade dispute will have on on exports. As a result of that, USDA raised their projection of ending stocks of soybeans up to about 955 million bushels, up 70 from where they were in in October. Stocks to use 23.25 percent, you know, approaching 25 percent. So now you've got stocks to use for soybeans starting to look like the type of stocks to use numbers we expect to see for wheat, you know, in the 20s and 30s. So uh, not a really good picture, I guess, for prospects for soybean prices moving forward. Now, complementing all of this, new indications on crop productivity in China, since you brought that country up, and uh, that maybe lends a different spin on some of this, doesn't it, Dan? Yeah, I think that the initial negative reaction to these uh, USDA report numbers that that occurred yesterday when the report came out uh, happened because of the adjustments that the USDA had made to the Chinese corn supply demand balance sheet. And basically, they they raised uh, ending stocks projections uh, in in China by about 140, 150 million bushels. And you can you can see that uh, the projection for world stocks. In uh, October, was 159 million metric tons, and and now it's 300, basically 308. And stocks used from 15.7 up to 27.2. So you know you look at that, and uh, your initial thought is, oh my gosh, we're now awash in corn stocks. But really, I think the way to look at this is is to try to isolate what China is doing, and, and keeping in mind that they're not an exporter of corn, anything they grow, they pretty much use domestically. And in fact, in, in the coming year and or years, they have a plan to dramatically increase their domestic ethanol production. So they'll be using all that much more corn. In reading the reports out of China of uh, why the change was made, apparently uh, there were a, a number of farms, probably smaller farms in the northern, northeast part of their crop production areas that for some reason weren't being reported. So now they have have larger ending stocks figures to work with. What I think makes more difference is what's happening in the rest of the world. Has that changed any? And when you look at the corn ending stocks for the world less China and stocks to use, actually we're as tight or tighter as, as we've been since basically 2015-16. In, in essence, outside of China, ending stocks out of this November report are in essence 100 million metric tons. Um, that's down about 0.85 million metric tons from um, from what we had in the October report, down about 18 from a year ago, down about 27 million metric tons from two years ago. So although the Chinese numbers are showing a sharp increase in ending stocks in their country, when you take that out and acknowledge that China's not going to export any of that, it's all domestic use, then really we haven't seen a lot of changes, if anything, a little bit of a tightening up in the rest of the world's corn market supply. So I think that's why after the news came out uh, on that report, initially with a negative response, the market ended up and closed just a little bit higher, about one to one and a half cents. So sort of took a look at that, then realized what it was, and then took the position that really doesn't affect the overall movement in the U.S. and corn market much to have that Chinese number change.
And what were the takeaways in as far as wheat supplies and what the USDA numbers said? Well, uh, there's actually uh, a bit of a positive story in wheat supplies. <laughs> if you look at the uh, U.S. supply demand balance sheet, not a lot of change, a little bit of a narrowing down of, of uh, U.S. ending stocks. Uh, anymore, we, I guess we counted a victory in the wheat market if we're just not increasing stocks. Uh, down to 949 million bushels, a little bit of change basically happening in uh, with increased seed usage that's uh, anticipated. So stocks to use projected at about 43.6, 43.7 percent stocks to use here in the U.S. Wheat stocks to use outside of China, again, uh, just like in, in the corn market, China has a good proportion, well over half of the world's wheat ending stocks or in its holdings, you isolate them out and look at stocks to use. Well, the stocks to use figure for the world is about 19.8%, down just marginally from October, down from 23.24% for both 2017-18, for 2015-16. and 16. So uh, really, the picture in the world wheat market, if you isolate China out of, out of this and their burgeoning stocks situation, is that uh, we're we're moving sideways to tighter on world wheat stocks. So uh, that picture, along with uh, some of the planting delays that we've had in hard red winter wheat country, has continued to offer at least moderate support in the wheat markets. And uh, again, if you look at where we're at, we're closing uh, yesterday, December, contract at 497 and a quarter, March 519 and a half. So again, this isn't 350, 375 wheat. We're still still uh, around $5, and I think this uh, generally tighter world supply-demand situation outside of China uh, is uh, offering some support to the market. Dan, of course, posts his updated notes on the grain markets weekly, and those are easily found at agmanager.info. As always, Dan, we appreciate your time, and we'll catch up with you again next Friday. Thanks, sir. Take care. That's Dan O'Brien. He's a grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today is back after this over the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and we've welcomed back in for another visit Dallas Peterson, Weed Management Specialist with K-State Research and Extension. This segment for you corn and grain sorghum producers, giving due thought to applying fall herbicides ahead of those crops to be sown next spring, getting the jump on several weed issues that might otherwise turn up. Dallas, you have proposed this idea year upon year, you still think it makes good practical sense for our producers out there? Yeah, well, certainly it's evolved through the years, you know, from the time we were doing tillage where we didn't worry, obviously, about any fall herbicide treatments. And as we made that uh, conversion to no-till, you know, the winter annual weeds became more and more problematic. And so definitely uh, fall applications can be very beneficial to help manage those winter annual weeds and make planting in the spring and weed control that next year much easier than if we don't do it. Now, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, time creeps up on us and we kind of forget about it. It's not as big of an obvious problem in the fall as it is in the spring. But if you can keep that in mind and kind of put that on your calendar and you have an opportunity to do it, fall applications can work extremely well to help manage those uh, early spring weeds. And when you say fall applications, the time frame can extend well into what some deem as even early winter, can't it? Yeah, and I really, the weather, I really need to define fall <laughs> applications because I'm not talking about a September uh, or even uh, early October type of application. I'm talking about a, a November application and even well into December, depending upon the conditions that we have. 
And, you know, this year with the wet weather that we've had recently, that's probably what we're looking at in many cases, especially if you were going to try to do it following soybeans because a lot of them haven't even been harvested yet. So, uh, yeah, the fall application time frame kind of moves around from year to year. It depends upon the season. Uh, but really, November is kind of prime time, in my opinion, to, to make those fall applications. What herbicide you're going to use will be dictated by the target weed species or the combination of species out there, correct? Yeah, target weed species and what your future cropping plans are. And of course, uh, with corn and sorghum, it can be pretty similar. Uh, You get into soybeans, of course, we're in many cases uh, talking about a different group of herbicides. Although, you know, even if we use non-residual herbicides like glyphosate and 2,4-D and dicamba, that can make a tremendous difference in itself. Now, none of those have much residual activity. You know, the dicamba actually does have some residual activity. So in many cases, you know, you want your weeds to be up uh, before making those applications. Uh, But that can, again, work quite well for uh, any of that mare's tail and hen bit and and the mustards and the other winter annuals that are up out there. If you have uh, the cheatgrass, downy brome as well, uh, again, those fall applications can work extremely well, better than a spring application from an efficacy standpoint in many cases. And again, it just makes it so much easier in the spring if you don't have to deal with those overwintered weeds. Well, one of the prime candidates in as far as product selection would be against those broadleaf weeds for sure, atrazine, right? Yeah, if you're going to corn or sorghum, that's almost a no-brainer, if you will. It's uh, inexpensive. It has residual control, pretty broad spectrum in nature. And so, again, you know, a pound to a pound and a half of atrazine uh, in the fall, usually in combination with something else, depending upon what your weed spectrum is, uh, either 2,4-D or dicamba. Uh, I like dicamba, to be honest with you, because I think it's better on the mare's tail than the 2,4-D is. And, and again, also provides some residual control. That's going to help keep those fields certainly clean through corn planting. Sorghum we plant later, and so it may start to break a little bit. But again, uh, you won't have those uh, bigger weeds, you know, maybe starting to bolt at that point in time, and you can still manage those more effectively in the spring. If you've got grass out there, you you need to add the glyphosate to it because although atrazine can provide some control of uh, volunteer cereals or the, the cheatgrass species, it's oftentimes not as consistent as it is when we add the glyphosate. Now, The one thing that can kind of make you wonder sometimes uh, if it's going to work is, again, our temperatures are pretty low uh, in many cases by the time we're making those. So glyphosate in particular, you might go out there a month later and think you didn't spray it. But interestingly enough, uh, come early March, uh, those weeds will be dead. So again, it, it works. It just works very slowly. A finer point, if one is tank mixing atrazine and glyphosate, those two chemistries sometimes don't get along in tank, right? Yeah, that is true. And so we've oftentimes suggested bumping that glyphosate rate a little bit to kind of compensate for that. Uh, Again, you want to pick a day, a nice day, when you make that application. And you want to to use all the recommended adjuvants uh, with those to make them uh, work uh, most effectively. Uh, But they can work okay together. And again, especially on, say, volunteer wheat and downy brome, because for the most part, those species are pretty susceptible to glyphosate. But you don't want to cheat on the rates. Uh, And in fact, you you know, you might even want to bump that rate from what you normally would do. But we pretty much commonly do that anyway these days uh, with the low price of glyphosate. You want to make sure you have enough in the tank uh, to do the job. You say, Dallas, if one is striving especially for residual activity as well, there are some other product considerations here, the ALS herbicides in particular, right? Yeah, and the other consideration is the species that you're after. And uh, even though it's not a winter annual, kochia is one that you might want to consider more residual products uh, for uh, in the western part of the state. It's not a winter annual, but it can start coming up in February in many cases. And uh, it's most easily controlled before it comes up, to be honest with you. After it comes up, it's harder to kill post-emergence. And so we have some residual herbicides uh, that can provide some help uh, with the atrazine in that regard. 
again, uh, dicamba out west, and again, a fairly good dose of dicamba is really helpful, a minimum of eight ounces and maybe a pint uh, of the Banville. In corn, at least, you can also go with some other alternative products like scoparia, which uh, can be pretty effective at providing residual control of the kochia. That name is kind of interesting. The scoparia uh, is the uh, the genus name of kochia. Mm. And so, again, it uh, is marketed primarily to target that kochia control in that uh, pre-plant corn time frame. So, uh, again, the ALS herbicides uh, and you know, the scoparia type of products can uh, also help us uh, give some residual control ahead of planting a corn. Uh, unfortunately, the scoparia is not labeled ahead of sorghum because of potential uh, injury to that sorghum. And as we talk about the fall applications here during roughly this month of November, getting to that residual question, uh, none of this necessarily precludes entirely a spring follow-up, if you will, right? Oh, absolutely not. And in fact, you really can't rely on those treatments, even those with the most residual, to provide much weed control into the growing season. So really, it, they are designed to control the winter annuals and the very early spring germinating summer annuals, such as kochia. Uh, they just are not going to persist long enough to provide uh, weed control into the summer. So you still need to follow up with your good residual program at or before planting uh, in corn and especially in grain sorghum. So we'll keep that well in mind. But with any of these alternatives, one obviously has to watch the uh, climate conditions and uh, find the appropriate window for application. That's that's always involved. Absolutely. As I indicated earlier, you want to pick a nice day, if you will, uh, in one probably where, you know, we're not expecting a uh, large uh, precipitation event uh, within a 24-hour period, that sort of thing. You don't want to be making applications when the ground is frozen uh, because of potential uh, off-site movement as well. So, yeah, you still want to look for that right window to make those applications, uh, but then they can work very well. And just as a final, finer point here, if you're using atrazine, remember that you are committing to a grain sorghum or corn crop, and you are locked in at that point. Absolutely. Uh, that's absolutely true. So remember these details, which are so germane to making these applications in the appropriate way. And there is full information, by the way, in the Chemical Weed Control for Field Crops Guide out of K-State. The latest edition is available online at agronomy.ksu.edu. Or you can, of course, refer to your local extension office. Dallas, we appreciate the word, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you. Very good. He is Dallas Peterson, a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Identically, there is an article in the Agronomy e-Update newsletter dated October the 19th on controlling annual weeds with fall applied herbicides ahead of corn and grain sorghum. Go to, again, agronomy.ksu.edu for that information resource as well. Briefly here, ahead of the break, and as fast as time flies at this point of the year... It's not too early to start talking about these. The 2019 K-State Corn Schools have been set up. Actually, there are two types of these informational sessions. The Corn Schools proper have been scheduled for January the 7th in Saline County, January 9th in Thomas County, and January the 11th in Douglas County. Then the pre-plant corn schools, these in February the 11th of February in Labette County, February 13th in Harvey County, and the 15th of February in Finney County. The details on the speakers and specific topics will be coming soon for these K-State Corn Production Schools coming up in early 2019. Agriculture Today will be back after these moments away. You are listening to the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu.
broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today, and welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Now, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. And starting with the Kansas numbers out of that USDA crop production report released yesterday based on November the 1st conditions, Kansas corn crop is now forecast at 663 million bushels, down 3% from last year's production. The harvested acres at 5.1 million, down 2% from a year ago. And the corn yield is forecast now at 130 bushels per acre, down 2 bushels from last year. The grain sorghum crop forecast at 228 million bushels, up 13% from last year. Harvested acreage, 2.65 million acres, up 8% from last year. And the sorghum yield at 86 bushels per acre, up four bushels from last year. And the Kansas soybean production would be a record forecast at 198 million bushels, up 3% from last year. Acreage harvested at 4.7 million, 8% below 2017. The yield, though, forecast at 42 bushels per acre, up 4.5 bushels from last year. And cotton production, by the way, in Kansas, a record this year, forecast at 342,000 bales, up 74% from last year. Harvested acres, 159,000, that's up 69,000 from 2017, and a record high, while the yield is forecast at 1,032 pounds per acre, down 19 pounds per acre from a year ago, according to the USDA in its November crop production report. Well, producer groups and agricultural organization members believe that a new farm bill will be completed and signed into law before Congress ends its current session this year. Here's more on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. Speculation has been the House and Senate Farm Bill Conference Committee would push during this lame duck session of Congress to have a new farm bill crafted, voted on, and signed into law by year's end. Several commodity groups keeping an eye on development say they believe the 2018 Farm Bill will become reality within the next two months. Dan Atkinson of the National Sorghum Producers says one signal that a new Farm Bill will advance soon is words from incoming House Ag Committee Chair Colin Peterson. Peterson has said that he definitely wants this off the table before he takes back over, and I have great confidence that the major four players can get that done. Yet Will Roger of the American Farm Bureau Federation notes two additional drivers for farm bill completion, certainty for producers dealing with low prices and changing trade landscapes, and certainty for Congress. They want to be able to say they've gotten something done, and I think that's true no matter which side of the aisle you're on. From the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention in Kansas City, I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The U.S., Mexico, and Canada intend to sign the updated NAFTA agreement on November the 30th at the G20 summit in Argentina. That, according to Mexico Economy Minister Aldefonso Guajardo, the current plan is for ministers from the three countries to sign the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, USMCA, at the summit in Buenos Aires. November the 30th is the earliest date the agreement can be signed, and it will allow the accord to be signed by the outgoing Mexican administration. Attention in the U.S. will then shift to the congressional approval of the deal. That's expected to come in early 2019. And proposed changes to the H-2B and H-2A temporary worker visa programs aimed at modernizing and streamlining the recruitment process were announced by the Department of Labor yesterday. The H-2A program allows employers to hire foreign workers on a temporary basis to fill positions for agricultural work they are unable to secure domestic labor to do. The H-2B program does the same, but for non-agricultural work. The current rules require employers to first advertise any job they're seeking temporary labor certifications for by publishing two print ads in a newspaper of general circulation in the area of intended employment. Now it's on to this week's edition of the Kansas Wheat Scoop for you. And with that this week is Jordan Hildebrand. Jordan? The phrase heard around the agriculture world is tell your story. Today, most Americans are three generations removed from the farm, so tales from the tractor are more important now 
than ever. Wheat farmers saw this need, and their conduit of conversation, eatwheat.org, is celebrating its first year of operation. Eat Wheat allows the wheat industry to speak with one voice in an effort to reclaim the national conversation on wheat and share one primary message amongst numerous influencers while we dismantle the false promises of wheatless diets. When urban consumers look down at their plate, many don't know how that food came from the farm to their table. While it may not be a topic of constant thought, many have begun to wonder about the farmers who produce the food that they consume and the processes used to create such a bounty. Kansas wheat farmers are the driving force behind eatwheat.org, which aims to create awareness on farm and production practices through the lens of food as identity. And the food that we think can connect us best is, of course, wheat. It's simple, it's versatile, it's natural, and it doesn't matter whether it's homemade for hours or picked up at the grocery store ready to go. It's a simple and natural way to connect to others and yourself. After a year of operation, the good news is that the conversation is working. Eat Wheat's Facebook follower count now ranks in the thousands, and Instagram is ever-growing. Videos produced sharing the story of American agriculture have garnered tens of thousands of views. Fast-paced videos showing quick and easy wheat-based recipes have amassed more than 70,000 views on Facebook alone. But the real value in the social media world is the conversations that have been had with consumers who simply want to know where their food comes from. During wheat harvest, nine food bloggers visited a Kansas wheat farm flour mill, and the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center. They baked with fellow blogger and popular cookbook author Zoe Francois of Artisan Bread in Five Minutes a Day. These bloggers shared their experiences learning more about wheat on their blogs and with their 5.4 million social media followers. Eat Wheat's standout traffic performer this year was Pinterest. The popular Pinterest account has garnered more than 3 million views per month on the wheat-based ideas shared on our feed. This totals more than 30 million pairs of eyes on wheat recipes in the last 10 months alone. While not every pin shared on the account comes from eatwheat.org, every pin is wheat-related. Every carb-tastic idea seen means that fewer fad diet ideas are shown, which leads to consumers rediscovering wheat in their families' diets. Now is the time to have these conversations with consumers. Wheat food consumption is on the rise for the first time in several years. In 2017, wheat for food rose 14 million bushels over the previous year, and flour consumption rose slightly to 131.8 pounds from 131.7 pounds per capita. If you're interested in learning more about the Eat Wheat Project, please visit eatwheat.org and amplify these messages by sharing social media posts at facebook.com slash eatwheat.org. For Kansas Wheat, this is Jordan Hildebrand. Thanks, Jordan. Well, now that this snowfall has uh, blown through, what's next for Kansas agricultural weather? Mary Knapp tells us in a moment on Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag predators, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and on we go now to our weekly look at Kansas agricultural weather. Alongside is climatologist Mary Knapp of K-State Research and Extension. And Mary, here we are, November the 9th, and for roughly the northern half of Kansas at least, we're in the midst of a winter wonderland. That's definitely the case here on campus. Right, and it it was truly a winter wonderland in that there was not a whole lot of wind, at least in the central and eastern part of the state, to accompany the snow. Soil temperatures are still fairly warm. So there was um, not as much problems on the roadways or the sidewalks with the accumulating snowfall. But we had some fairly decent numbers out in northwestern Kansas. Goodland Station reported three and a half inches of snow, and there's still three of it 
inches on the ground. Concordia, not quite as much. Um, They were in the two-inch range here in Manhattan. uh, We had about an inch and a half on the ground, but we had more like three inches on the trees because, again, that elevated surface uh, stayed a little bit colder and allowed for that accumulation. Again, the nice feature was that there was not a lot of wind with it, so we didn't have as much problem with um, breaking branches. We still have a lot of trees that have their leaves on it, and that could have been a serious issue. Fortunately, we got by fairly luckily on that. Clear skies today, and that's going to mean the temperatures are going to plunge. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at maybe 15 for a low. Some places will probably get even colder than that. You mentioned the soil temperatures, and with this drop-off in our temps starting tonight, that those soil temperatures are holding up well will be reassuring for winter wheat. Right. With that and with the areas that have some snow cover on there, that will give a little bit of an insulation factor for that winter wheat, give it a little bit more time to harden before we uh, really truly get into the winter temperatures. Our wheat planting and wheat emergence is not as far along as we would like. We're well behind our average for the date. So again, a little bit more growing time would be welcome for uh, those um, winter crops. And in fact, we have plenty of field work to be done. Fall harvest is not complete. Wheat needs to be planted in some areas, and this recent moisture will do nothing but inhibit that further. Right. We were not wetter than normal for the week. In fact, uh, we were about a third of our normal statewide. But given the very wet conditions that we had ending October, that little extra on top is just enough to keep the fields wet and difficult to work. And that's likely to be extended by the snow that we got. The liquid equivalents of the snowfall have varied, but we're looking at about a 10 to 1, believe it or not, ratio. So an inch of snow translates to about a tenth of an inch of of liquid out of that, which again is enough to to wet that surface again and uh, keep people out of the field a couple of days. And of course, the evapotranspiration is very low this time of year. Right. Um, We can have some fairly high evaporations when we have um, the very low humidities and some strong winds, but that has not been the case this week. And so with the cold temperatures, lack of wind, a lot of cloud cover, there wasn't a whole lot to drive any um, evaporation. Uh, We're not going to get much in the way of transpiration at this time because vegetative activity is just really, really low in in anything except uh, those uh, fall planted crops. As we're talking about moisture, let's go ahead, Mary, and bring to the attention of folks out there a new service on the Mesonet website out of K-State. You have a soil moisture page. Tell us what that's about. Right. Um, uh, at our uh, 30-foot towers around the state, we have soil monitoring, soil moisture monitoring equipment. We have uh, soil monitoring probes at uh, various depths, uh, including down to 50 centimeters. So you can see how that soil moisture is making its way through the profile, how the surface is drying out. Uh, The page also has an about page that describes in detail the instrumentation that is used to monitor that and how the um, soil moisture is calculated and, again, some various ways that you can utilize the information on the page. It really is a neat, informative tool, and it is updated, that is, the data on a regular basis. Right. It's updated about every hour, so you can look at that and see as that's changing. Another nice feature on this particular page is in addition to the current snapshot of what's happening, you can look at the seven-day pattern and see how it has changed the current picture has changed from the seven days previous to that, which is a, a nice advantage to look at seeing whether that soil's drying down or wetting up. Yeah, so producers, have a look at that. It's at M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U, mesonet dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. All right, then what's ahead? And you touched upon it just a moment ago. This evening, our temperatures will drop dramatically and considerably lower than the norm for this time of year. Right. We'll be getting down into the teens in a lot of cases. 
question will be, does that cold penetrate down to our holdout in um, southeast Kansas? <laughs> we still have one of our mesonet stations that has not hit freezing, and it looks like it will fall this weekend. That cold weather is likely to extend through the week. It won't be quite as cold, but it will still be trending below average for the period. As we go into the end of November, things are a little bit more encouraging. The 8 to 10 day outlook, which carries us through the 30th of November, calls for warmer and drier than normal conditions. That would be welcome. I'd give it a chance to get some of the field work accomplished and maybe have a little bit less uh, difficulty if anybody's planning on uh, holiday travels. Mm-hmm. So looking forward to that, but uh, we've uh, about three or four, maybe more days to work through what we basically have now. Right. And it will certainly uh, get a foretaste of winter with this uh, weekend weather that we're expecting. Well, Mary, we always appreciate the update and many thanks. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Eric. Our regular Friday guest to get into the latest from the Weather Data Library here at K-State on Kansas Agricultural Weather, climatologist Mary Knapp. Our time is away for today and for the week. Before we go, this reminder, if you'd like to listen to our broadcast anytime you choose, you can go to agtoday.net. There you can listen on demand and find links to subscribe to our podcast via an assortment of apps at your preference agtoday.net. Meantime, enjoy your weekend, and we hope you'll be back with us right here this same time on Monday. Until then, Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.